In the autumn of 1888, a series of brutal murders in the East End of London lit a flame that sent shockwaves reverberating around the civilized world and caused a scandal that struck right at the heart of the British establishment. Over a hundred years have now passed since the so-called Autumn of Terror and easily as many suspects have been put forward as likely perpetrators of the crimes. Some are just downright ridiculous. Others seem highly possible but lack the elusive grail of cast iron proof. Today, as many books have shown, it is possible to put just about anybody into the frame and then build a plausible sounding case against them. The truth is that if we're to stand any chance of solving the mystery, we must put the crimes back into the context of the age and the streets in which they occurred. Then, and only then, do you stand any chance of solving what is without doubt the world's greatest whodunit. And one of the first problems to face the budding ripperologist is exactly how many of the Whitechapel murders were at the hands of Jack the Ripper. Officially, there were only five Jack the Ripper victims, although there were two other murders that happened before that of Polly Nichols, which most history books considered the first Jack the Ripper murder, um, the murders of Emma Elizabeth Smith in April 1888 and that of Martha Tabram or Turner in August 1888 are considered by some people to have been the early sort of works of Jack the Ripper. So officially there's only five, but there may have been two others before that. And there were a couple of copycats later on in 1889, and sort of later, um, Alice Mackenzie and Francis Coles. In the century and more since the murders occurred, the Victorian police have been subjected to a constant barrage of criticism owing to their apparent inability to catch the killer. This is largely undeserved. They were, after all, hampered by a lack of modern investigative techniques. DNA profiling, forensic science, even fingerprinting were not established forms of police procedure. And can we, in all honesty, say that modern methods would have fared any better against a lone murderer who is not known to his victims and who leaves no clues behind? Indeed. It can be argued that, given the resources available to them, Inspector Abilene and his fellow detectives did a first-rate job. And let us not forget that if, as seems likely, Mary Kelly was Jack the Ripper's final victim, then something most certainly happened to the killer when he left behind the bloody carnage at Miller's Court. The fact is, the murders stopped for a reason. And the only reason can have been that something happened to the murderer to stop him killing. Was he caught? Did he die? Was he incarcerated in a lunatic asylum? Murderers like this don't give up. Murderers like this continue, unless they are caught. A number of senior officers um, are on record as having said that, or, or having favoured certain suspects as being Jack the Ripper. Most famously, there is Sir Robert Anderson and Donald Sutherland Swanson. In 1910, Sir Robert Anderson, as he had then become, wrote his memoirs entitled The Lighter Side of My Official Life. And in those memoirs, he states the following. Undiscovered murders are rare in London, and the Jack the Ripper crimes do not fall into this category. I am almost tempted to disclose the identity of the murderer, but no public benefit would result from such a course. In saying that he was a Polish Jew, I am merely stating a definitely ascertained fact. I will merely add that the only person who ever had a good view of the murderer unhesitatingly identified the suspect the instant he was confronted with him, but he refused to testify. So not only does Anderson say that the police caught Jack the Ripper, he also claims that there was a witness who had seen the face of the murderer. But who was that witness? Well, it can only have been one of two people, either Israel Schwartz, who saw the man attack Elizabeth Stride, or Joseph Luenda, who saw Catherine Eddowes talking with the man outside Mitre Square. I would personally say that it was Israel Schwartz because Anderson also said that this man was the only person to have got a good view of the murderer. And Lavender only had a passing, took a passing look at the, uh, at the man that he saw and, and really didn't pay very much attention at all and, and consistently said afterwards that he would not be in a position to identify the man if, if confronted with him. 
Sir Robert Anderson presented a copy of his memoirs to his old colleague and fellow Ripper investigator, Donald Sutherland Swanson. In the 1980s, Swanson's grandson gave that copy to the Daily Telegraph. Penciled notes that Swanson had scribbled into the margin of the book certainly made for interesting reading and brought modern-day Ripper investigators considerably closer to identifying Anderson's suspect. And he says the suspect was called Kosminski. Doesn't give us a Christian name, but uh, insofar as research thus far has been able to, to reveal, there is only one Kosminski that, that could fit the bill because we're told that this Kosminski was committed to an asylum and the only Kosminski found in the asylum records, which was found by Martin Fido, uh, is a man called Aaron, or Aaron Kosminski. Swanson also says that the reason the witness would not give evidence was because the suspect was also a Jew and the witness's evidence would be the means of the murderer being hanged, which he did not want on his mind. If we believe the marginalia, then he was, there, were, there was some reason why the police suspected him. Uh, he was taken with difficulty to a place called the Seaside Home to be identified, and that was probably the convalescent police Seaside Home in, in Brighton, where he was positively identified. The police then, for reasons which uh, baffle everybody, uh, released him. Now the probability is, is that they didn't have grounds for holding on to him any, any longer. The Habeas Corpus Act uh, means that you have to bring charges within a given period of time, or you have to release the individual. If they were not prepared to bring charges, because our witness apparently refused to testify or to give evidence, uh, the police would have had to have released him. He then was returned to his brother's house in the heart of Whitechapel, and his family almost immediately appeared to have had him committed uh, to the, into the asylum. In early 1891, Aaron Kosminski was officially found to be of unsound mind, and on the 7th of February, he was committed to the County Lunatic Asylum at Colney Hatch in North London. In 1988, researchers began combing the records for that elusive piece of information that might prove Kosminski's guilt once and for all. That search brought two investigators to the door of Zena Shine, who was born in the East End of London in 1925, and whose great uncle, Aaron Kosminski, was indeed committed to Colney Hatch Asylum. It was astonishing. The two men knocked at the door, and they said that there's somebody living here who knew the Kosminski family. They said that it was um, a centenary or something and that the case had remained open. And they said, do you have a relation called Kosminski? And I said, it was my grandfather. They said, did I know the rest of the family? I said, I, I think he had a brother. And they told me about this brother, Aaron, Aaron. They said that we think he died in Coney Hatch. Coney Hatch, you know, you, you know, things began to come back. All these little stories. All the family used to talk about Coney Hatch. And it was a major disgrace, the brother. After a little while, I began to understand a bit of Yiddish, and I could understand what they were talking about a bit here and there. They used to sort of, you know, Aaron, it was, you know, it was sort of, very deprecating and they didn't, there was never any lengthy discussion, it was always just a reference. But there was never any connection, it didn't mean anything to me, I couldn't understand the significance of anything. And when I told my brother, he was so appalled, he didn't even think it was funny, he was appalled. He said, if that's your claim to fame, forget it. Who wants to be connected to somebody, do you know? I mean, really? And so we find ourselves today in the position of probably knowing more about the major suspect than the majority of the detectives at the time knew. Yet that final piece of the jigsaw eludes us. 
If we could only uncover the evidence on which Anderson and Swanson based their suspicions, it might be possible for us to complete the puzzle and solve the mystery of Jack the Ripper once and for all. Unfortunately, many of the papers relating to the Jack the Ripper investigation have either been destroyed or else have disappeared from the official files. And without them, it is impossible to establish the guilt of one particular suspect above all others. I haven't the remotest idea who, who, he, who Jack the Ripper was. I, I, I would put Kosminski at the top of the totem pole, as it were, uh, simply because Anderson and Swanson were the two most senior officers investigating the Ripper case and it's reasonable to assume that they would have known the evidence against every major suspect. And if they thought that Kosminski, the evidence against Kosminski was better than the evidence against any of the others, Kosminski would be the, the probable leading contender for the, for the mantle of being Jack the Ripper. One thing, however, is certain. The legend of Jack the Ripper refuses to die, and interest in him increases with every year that passes. And with so many dedicated researchers still on his trail, the day may yet come when Jack the Ripper is finally brought to book. Until then, he will remain much what he has been for over a hundred years, an elusive nightmare that haunts our imaginations, where he is able to instill feelings of fear and fascination in equal measure. But his story also provides a window through which we can gaze back onto a bygone age when a lone figure stalking the streets of London really did succeed in shaking the British establishment to its very core.